Hello, everyone. Russ of Aquarimax Pets here, and I am very pleased to introduce William Hayborn. Welcome. Hi, Russ. Thanks so much for the invitation. Glad yeah, to be thank here. You. Thank you for joining us. Absolutely. Uh, so could you give us a little bit of introduction into your background before we dig deeper into reptile venom? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, William Hayborn. I'm, uh, I'm currently uh, professor of biology at Southern Utah University. I've got a, another administrative role here at the university as well, but I try to keep that a secret and just tell people that I'm a I'm a faculty member. That's that's my my love and my passion. Um, I teach a variety of, uh, of zoology and conservation biology type courses here at the university. Um, I'm actually an alumnus of Southern Utah University. Uh, did my bachelor's degree here uh, many years ago, um, mm -hmm. and then um, spent some time working in the, the resource management world, uh, natural resource management, working for the Bureau of Land Management, Utah Division of Wildlife, uh, then went on and did a, a master's degree in entomology at Oregon State University. So I know we're here to talk about reptiles today, um, but um, for the the invertebrate lovers uh, in your audience. Uh, I'm an invertebrate lover as well. Um, so spent several years um, teaching and, and studying and, uh, and working in the entomology department at Oregon State, and then uh, went on and did a PhD in the lab of Dr. Steve Mackesy at the University of Northern Colorado. And that's where I really got into the venom world. Um, I'm, I'm really interested in what could broadly be termed um, community ecology, because I'm really interested in how different types of organisms interact with one another. And um, so the, the entomological work that I've done has mostly been community-based. So for example, looking at the impacts of, um, of forest management on insect communities, that's what I studied for my master's degree. And so then when I went on to do PhD work, you know, although I was doing a, a whole lot of, of biochemistry, what I was really interested in and really passionate about were those predator prey interactions. So what are these venomous animals eating and how does their, their dietary preference um, relate to the makeup of their, of their venom? So that was really the story that I was attempting to uncover um, during those, those years. But um, I'm just, uh, I'm, I'm a biologist at heart. I think that I was born to be a, a biologist. I was one of those kids who, you know, as a, a five-year-old, I was tromping around in the, in the creek near my parents' house and catching lizards and, and insects of various sorts and snakes, putting them in my pockets and taking them home. And fortunately, I had a mom who was just really um, supportive of those interests, even if she wasn't interested herself and she was a little scared sometimes, she showed a lot of interest in it because it was something that I was interested in. And uh, so I've just, you know, I've spent my whole professional career sort of feeling like that eternal five-year-old, but rather than catching snakes and bugs and taking them home to show my mom, uh, you know, I'm catching them and taking them to campus to share with my students. So <laughs> never, never grown up, been that five-year-old for many years now. That's the best way to do it. Absolutely. Fantastic. So uh, before um, we, we go into the venom research that you did, uh, specifically the more specific uh, topics that you focused on, can we talk a little bit about what venom is and what it isn't and how yeah, that relates yeah. to reptiles? Absolutely. Yeah, if you um, if you, you dig into the, the popular sort of media coverage of um, venomous animals, they'll frequently use the term poisonous mm -hmm. um, and they'll use the terms venom and poison synonymously. But biologically, we really try to differentiate between these two terms where um, we generally consider uh, a poison to be something that um, has a significant you know, biological impact on another organism, but it's delivered through ingestion, right? So you have to consume um, that poisonous thing um, in order to um, have any sort of negative effects. Venom, on the other hand, um, needs to get into your blood. So um, typically when we're talking about venom, we say that venoms need to be 
injected rather than ingested. Uh, it's, it's a little bit of a fine line in a couple of areas because uh, there are some organisms that, um, that utilize certain toxins that can be both venomous and poisonous. For example, the tetrodotoxins. And I know you're a fish guy, mm -hmm. Russ. So, um, you know, the, um, the lionfish and, and some of those critters that utilize tetrodotoxins, um, they not only have the tetrodotoxin in their tissues, but they also have it at the ends of those, um, those, those barbs on their fins. Right. And so they can be both venomous and poisonous using the same, um, the same family of, of toxic materials. And, and I guess we should talk about toxins here for just a minute, because sometimes um, people will also um, talk about venoms as being either a hemotoxin or a neurotoxin, as if, you know, they only have a, a singular effect in their, their prey. And that's just not a uh, an evolutionary, evolutionarily advantageous way to deal with, um, with prey or, or, or for protection if, if, the, if it's being used as a protective measure rather than a, a prey um, uh, sequestration measure. Um, you know, why, why only rely on a single toxin to kill your prey when you could have five or six or 10 or 20 different toxins that all work independently to target some different aspect of the prey animal's physiology to take that thing out as rapidly as possible. And so each one of those different effects would be um, typically um, delivered to the prey animal by a different toxin. And so venoms, for the most part, um, are going to be made up of a whole array of different types of toxic molecules or toxins, if you will, um, that are that are in that venom. Poisonous animals are sometimes the same. Um, poisonous animals can sometimes have more than one particular type of toxin that they might use to, um, to you know, have that poisonous uh, effect. Um, poisons tend to be a little simpler than venoms, but that's not a hard and fast rule. Hope that answered the question. Yeah, yeah, I think that helps a lot. And uh, so you would you say it's fair to say that even though sometimes we speak of a particular snake, for example, as having a primarily hemotoxic venom, that is generally, it's not the case that it is solely hemotoxic. It's just there's a, a big punch of hemotoxic venom and then there are other, maybe some neurotoxins in there as well. Yeah, exactly. And, and you nailed it right there with the word toxins, right? Because uh, yeah, there, there may be a, a series of toxins that all, you know, maybe target the blood clot cascade or something, right? And so that's what we might consider to be a, a hemotoxic venom. But yeah, you're absolutely right. It's going to be really unusual to only have those types of toxins in a venom. More often than not, there would also be some neurotoxic molecules or other sorts of things in there as well, but at lesser concentrations. And so the primary effect on the prey animal or someone who's inadvertently bitten by this animal might be those, those hemolytic effects as opposed to the neurotoxic effects. But then another animal would, you know, might be exactly the opposite. And there are, there are instances where um, we actually see um, sort of a shift between um, those extremes in that continuum, if you will, over the course of uh, a single animal's lifespan. Um, this is, this is one of the, the stories that we really started to develop um, during my early years in the Mackesy lab, um, this idea of um, an ontogenetic shift in, in venom makeup. So ontogeny is just the, the fancy way of, of saying development, right? right. Um, so over the developmental um, timeline of an individual animal's life from being a hatchling to an adult, um, we might see some pretty dramatic changes in the venom. And, uh, and we've, we've seen that now in a whole bunch of different snakes. And it seems to correlate with uh, the type of prey animal that the, the snake is, is primarily taking at various points in its, um, in its lifespan. For example, um, some of the first species where this was documented, um, like the, the brown tree snake, um, Brown tree snakes pr uh, prey primarily on lizards as a juvenile, 
and primarily on birds as an adult. And the, the physiology of lizards and birds is very different. And so over the course of the lifespan of that animal, there are some corresponding shifts in the makeup of the venom where uh, you know, they, they may need to, to do something slightly different with that venom if they're trying to take a lizard versus trying to take a bird. And we've seen that same sort of story play out in, uh, in rattlesnakes and lots of other organisms now uh, over the, the last decade and a half or so. Uh, so ontogenetic shifts, pretty interesting um, phenomenon. <laughs> That is that is really fascinating, because I think the idea of taxon specific venom by itself is fascinating. And when I first thought of it, I just said, oh, OK, that makes sense. Certain species are going to be lizard specialists or bird specialists or whatever. Totally makes sense. But I never really thought of that in terms of an ontogenetic change over the lifespan of an animal, even though I was aware that, you know, many snakes and other animals will target different prey items at different ages. That's just really cool. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. And there, and there are some interesting um, sort of myths that, that are born out of this as well. So, you know, one of these myths that I, that I constantly am asked about is uh, this idea that, that juvenile rattlesnakes are somehow incapable of metering their venom, right? That, you know, maybe rattlesnakes are a lot more dangerous because they can't control their venom. And that's not true. Um, they're capable of metering their venom just like an adult. You know, maybe they're not as sophisticated because they haven't had the same practice. We, you know, we don't know. Nobody's really looked at that. But regardless, um, envenomating a, an animal is an expensive proposition for a reptile, right? It's, it, it takes a lot of energy to make all of those complex proteins that are in that venom. And so they don't want to just indiscriminately um, deliver venom. They want to meter it in a, in a way that's going to be uh, beneficial to them. And so these juvenile rattlesnakes, yes, they can, they can meter their venom, but there still is, at least for some species, an element of truth to the fact that, um, or to the idea that they're more dangerous as juveniles. It has nothing to do with the fact that they can or can't meter their venom. Instead, it has to do with this idea of an ontogenetic shift where in some of the, the rattlesnake species that have been well studied, the proportion of neurotoxic components of their venom is much higher in the juveniles than it is in the adults. And in the adults, it's a much higher concentration of these proteolytic, protein digesting enzymes that are in their venom and a lesser concentration of neurotoxins. And, and it makes sense if you think about what these animals are doing out in the environment where as juveniles, you know, you've got this little tiny baby rattlesnake, just a few inches long, you know, not much bigger around than your pinky finger. Um, it's dangerous to, um, to take a prey animal because a prey animal could severely injure you as a juvenile. And so it makes sense that you're going to be able to bite and dispatch that thing very rapidly so that it can't um, harm you as it's, as it's dying. Um, so you need to, you need those neurotoxins as a, as a juvenile, as an adult, those rattlesnakes are often taking fairly large prey animals, um, which, you know, there's still some danger, um, in, in taking a, a large prey animal, but the bigger danger, particularly for some of these more temperate species of rattlesnakes is, you know, if you, if you say you're eating a, a cottontail rabbit or something, and you're a, um, a, a diamondback rattlesnake. That's a fairly large prey animal. And if you're living in an environment where it gets really cool at night, or maybe it's the, the beginning or the end of the season, and you know, unless you're out basking somewhere, it's relatively cool. You get this large prey animal down in your stomach, and there's a chance that that animal could decay in your stomach before you have a chance to digest it. And so by having this higher concentration of protein digesting enzymes, in your venom, you can insert that venom into the prey animal so you can start digesting that thing from the inside out as the stomach enzymes are then digesting from the outside in. And so you've now just reduced your chances of you know, developing sepsis or something from this rotting um, prey animal inside of your digestive tract. So just uh, fascinating implications for the biology of these venomous animals once you start diving in and thinking about what they eat and where they live and how they get their prey, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. That is really amazing. That was an excellent 
uh, illustration of how that applies. Uh, it's, it's really easy to visualize the importance of that, why that would evolve. Definitely some adaptive value there. Mm -hmm. So we have a question from a viewer here. And I think this is a great question. What, what would happen if you put venom in the oven? I think I know the answer, but I'd like to hear what, what you say about that. Yeah, that's a, that's a fascinating question. So it, it helps, uh, helps to remember what venoms are largely made of. So those, those individual toxins that we're talking about there um, are almost all proteins. And proteins, as we know, um, have a, a fairly narrow temperature range at which they can be active. Um, typically going above that range and sometimes below that range as well can result in something that we call denaturation. Uh, and denaturation is just a fancy way of saying that this complex three-dimensional protein that has this specific three-dimensional shape and it's that shape that confers its activity in the prey animal, when that protein is subjected to high temperatures, that folding um, gets disrupted. And so if you put venom proteins in the oven at too high of a temperature, um, those proteins are going to denature and they become inactivated. Um, there are some, some interesting ramifications here biologically because um, venomous animals are going to have to maintain those proteins within that narrow temperature range, right? Right. Fortunately, um, that range is typically the range at, um, at which those animals are going to want to be anyway for their own, um, you know, well-being. So it's, it's not, um, it's not too tricky. Um, but in terms of using venoms, um, in a, in a laboratory setting or something like that, we have to pay really close attention to the temperature range because um, subjecting them to a, a high temperature, um, you know, may, as we said, denature those proteins and render them um, inactive. It, this is there's actually an interesting story here. When I was a doctoral student in Dr. Mackesy's lab, um, he actually consulted as he as he's done several times over the years um, for a popular television show where, if I remember the details right. Um, the, the riders wanted to have somebody, you know, kill off their, their husband or their wife or something by putting um, snake venom in their coffee. And, you know, so he had to walk the riders through this whole scenario, uh, you know, regarding why that wouldn't be an effective means to take somebody out, right? You put those, you put snake venom in coffee, the hot coffee denatures those proteins and they're rendered um, completely harmless. Um, but, um, you know, the other problem there is, you know, for, for most of us with a, a healthy, intact digestive tract, don't do this, but we, you know, we could drink venom and, um, and, with, and with a healthy, intact digestive tract, um, nothing's going to happen to us. It would pass into our stomach. It hits the, um, the acidic conditions of the stomach. And the other way to denature a protein aside from heat is, um, is changing the pH. And so it hits the acidic stomach. Those proteins are rendered inactive and they don't do anything to us. So, right. so yeah. double uh, that uh, murder attempt would be doubly ineffective. <laughs> yep. Yep. So I don't, I don't remember the resolution. You know, they'd have to you know, put it in their iced tea or something instead and have the person have, uh, you know, an ulcer or something. Something. Yeah. I don't, I don't know the, the way they resolved that. You know, why didn't they just you know, use the candlestick in the library or something. <laughs> Make it exactly. Okay. So here is a question I think relates directly to what we wanted to, some of the things we wanted to talk about today from Ruben. If you have opinions or information about monitor lizard venom. Yeah. Um, monitor lizard venom. Wow. Um, this, uh, this is an interesting story that is um, taking kind of a long time to, to unravel. So I was, I was actually working uh, at the Venom Analysis Lab at the University of Northern Colorado when uh, a, a zookeeper at the Central Florida Zoo was um, actually bitten by a, a desert monitor, Varanus grecius. And, um, and this keeper experienced a lot of symptoms 
that were indicative of um, the, the bite from um, a, a, a snake with some neurotoxic components in its venom. The, for example, the person got droopy eyelids, um, kind of slurred speech. Um, you know, ha- it was clear that their nervous system was impacted by the bite of this lizard. And, and that really um, set off or set into motion um, this desire to, to understand what's going on with, with monitor um, lizard saliva. Is there, um, is there truly venom in there or not? And the story that has developed over the last 20 years or so is that um, there are very clearly um, proteins in the, the saliva, excuse me, of some monitor lizards that are the same families of proteins as we would commonly see in, say, venomous snakes. Um, in addition, there's been some work looking at the, um, the histology of the salivary glands. Uh, histology is just the scientific study of tissues, right? And so they've, they've dissected out the salivary glands of some of these monitor lizards, examined them microscopically, and what they've discovered is that there are different regions of the salivary glands, and those different re- some some regions of the salivary gland are producing these proteins, like we would see in venoms, and other parts of the salivary glands are producing mucus and some of the other things that we typically associate with um, with the salivary glands. the The question that is still out and hasn't been clearly um, understood is, um, so we do have these venom-like proteins in the saliva of some of the monitors. Is that biologically significant? Is it ecologically significant? And it's difficult to do those sorts of studies in, um, in an ecological and in a natural sort of environment, right? And so it's hard for us to say definitively, oh yeah, this monitor lizard, when it bites its prey, you know, the prey dies, you know, this fast versus this other species, when it bites its prey, it takes much longer. So clearly there is, you know, something in that saliva, which is leading to the the rapid death rate in one species versus the other. We can do some of that work, um, what we call um, in vitro. So, you know, in test tubes in a, in a laboratory setting um, where you can actually take live animals and inject them with, um, with the saliva of monitor lizards or even with purified proteins from monitor lizards. And some of those in vitro studies um, seem to indicate that those proteins are venom-like proteins, but whether there's enough of that in the saliva to elicit an effect in a, a wild animal, you know, out, out in out doing its thing ecologically, that hasn't been um, well described yet. So I guess the answer is um, we don't know. Maybe. Okay. But so it's safe to say that there are venom-like proteins in the saliva definitely being produced. We just don't know how much of an ecological effect they have, especially since, as far as we know, no monitor lizards have like efficient venom delivery systems to the extent like a viper would or anything. Correct. Correct. Yeah. So, you know, that's true of all of the the venomous lizards. So, you know, we've got beaded lizards and Gila monsters, which for a very long time we've considered to be venomous. Uh, And then this growing um, array of, of quadrupedal reptiles that, um, four-legged reptiles, lizards that seem to have venom-like proteins in their saliva. And you're exactly right. Um, none of them have uh, a venom delivery mechanism like we see in the front fang snakes. You know, the, the, the dentition, the teeth of front fang snakes, those fangs are like a hypodermic needle, right? Where they penetrate the flesh of their prey animal and they're hollow on the inside. Those fangs are attached to a venom gland that is under muscular control. And so they can squeeze those glands and express that venom very uh, forcefully into the the prey animal. So it's a very efficient delivery mechanism. In the the lizards, including Gila monsters and uh, and beaded lizards, um, you know, they've got um, kind of 
um, salivary glands associated with their teeth. Their teeth are kind of jagged and gnarly. And when they bite, they kind of chew. And as they're chewing, then some of those um, salivary proteins can get into the wound. So it's just not nearly as sophisticated as what we see in the snakes. Uh, um, it, it probably is worth pointing out here that, um, you know, we, we do have a, uh, there is a venom scientist, um, toxicologist by the name of Brian Fry. He lives and works in Australia, um, you know, does a lot of stuff in the, in the popular media. He, uh, he's done a lot of work sort of looking at the evolutionary origins of venom. He's proposed some, um, some new taxonomy based on which reptiles produce venom-like proteins and which don't. And that there's some controversy there. Um, but, you know, one of the things that his group has shown is that, um, you know, even animals as benign as bearded dragons, which I'm sure some of your listeners keep as pets, right? right. Um, bearded dragons even have venom-like proteins in their saliva. And so this, um, this production of these venom-like proteins seems to go way back in the evolutionary um, history of reptiles. So pretty fascinating story. Interesting. So I, that kind of relates to one of the questions I was going to ask you, because I've certainly heard uh, stories about venom in monitor lizards of various types, including Komodo dragons. And I, I assume that what we spoke about, about varanids in general applies to Komodo dragons, that they're venom-like proteins, but we don't know how significant that is and how they conduct their lives. Correct. Um, Droth was asking about that, one of the patrons. So I think that answers your question, Droth, there. Um, what other taxa in the quadrupedal reptiles? Uh, so we've covered the um, halodermatids, the Mexican beaded lizards, and the Gila monsters, the varanids. And then you mentioned bearded dragons. Any other taxa in quadrupedal reptiles that are known to have a lot of this going on? Yeah, so the, the varanids um, are, are the, the best studied. Um, you know, I, I haven't followed this, uh, this story in the literature enough over the last few years to know where this is showing up most recently. Um, but, you know, so we've got the agamids, which are the, uh, you know, which include bearded dragons. dragons. We've got the varanids. Um, yep, we've got the Gila monster and bearded dragon. Um, some of the iguanids have some venom-like um, proteins in their saliva. Um, I, I can't recall who else but it's pretty broadly distributed um, among this group. Cool. So it, likely enough, there are species and taxa families genera everything that have been, haven't really been studied a whole lot oh, in that respect that probably have some. Absolutely. Absolutely. Particularly if the evolution of, um, of uh, you know, these venom-like proteins and salivary secretions, if, particularly if it goes back as far as we think that it does. So it's, it seems to be a fairly basal characteristic. Yep, absolutely. Cool. All right. So um, one, here was a question. Ewan had a question about uh, the evolution of venom, basically. Which taxonomic groups of snakes began showing sign of venoms and potential selective pressures for doing so? Yeah. Hi, Ewan. Uh, this is one of my former students um, here cool. at, at SUU. Um, so this is a, a difficult question to get at um, for a couple of reasons. Um, one is, um, you know, salivary glands, venom glands, they don't fossilize, right? Soft tissues don't fossilize. Um, so we're, we're going to be dependent on skeletal cues here. And um, snake skeletons are pretty delicate. And so we just don't have a ton of, of snake skeleton material uh, which we can work with to, to try and get at this, um, this question from direct paleontological evidence. So instead, we rely on um, kind of um, genetic time clocks and, um, and, and looking at, at how quickly things are known to, uh, to evolve um, and then making some inferences about when various groups of animals may have split off from one another. So um, in, in answer to Ewan's question, it looks like this, um, this characteristic of venomousness um, probably evolved before snakes split off from their um, lizard ancestors. Um, 
So uh, I, don't, I don't know the answer to this question um, other than to say it was a long time ago. Um, and the, the really sophisticated venom delivery systems that we see now in the Vipers and the Elapids, that's probably a, a much more recent um, event evolutionarily, but the ability to produce venom goes way, way back. Cool. Yeah, uh, let's see. And apparently there are some, uh, I've read accounts of various venomous mammals too, some of which were, are still around, so. Yeah, things there's, even a, you know, there's even a, a venomous primate, which is yeah. you know weird. So one of these, you know, primitive little primates that actually has a, a, a gland in the crook of its elbow and it, you know, licks those proteins up and then delivers them through its saliva when it when it bites its its insect prey. It's pretty crazy. Yeah, I remember writing writing a little piece on that on that and um, venomous mammals. And that was one of the species I wrote about. It was very, yeah. it's very interesting. So it's been around for a very long time. And some of the uh, more basal mammals, like the monotremes, like the platypus have venom glands, even though they're uh, quite a bit different in anatomical structure, they've still got them. So that's interesting too. Yeah, and well, and the other the other strange thing with um, with platypus, you know, typically when we think about, about reptilian venoms, we think about the role that those venoms play in terms of prey acquisition. Right. And, and, our, and our, our current understanding or, or current theory here is that venoms probably evolved, you know, primarily for prey acquisition. And if they are used defensively, that's probably a secondary adaptation. Mm -hmm. And in platypus, it looks to be exactly the opposite because the platypus, the males are, you know, using those spurs to try and stab each other right. um, during their, their mating bouts. And so in that case, at least it appears that the venom probably evolved for this defensive sort of um, strategy first. And whether it's used for something secondarily, you know, I, I don't know enough about platypus biology to say, but it's just uh, it's it's a unique case, I think. Right. Um, I can't think of reptiles that really use venom in intraspecific competition. <laughs> nope. That's that's really interesting. So. Uh, there was another question somebody had. Um, okay, so Ruben was wondering, um, northern water snakes have an anticoagulant, apparently. Okay. They do. Yeah, um, this is, a, this is a, an interesting case. Um, because if you look at uh, the, the prey, the primary prey of northern water snakes, um, we're talking about primarily fish and amphibians. And um, those two prey, two groups of prey animals are relatively easily dispatched. Um, it's not, you know, like you've got this, this combative mammal that's going to, to potentially injure you as you're trying to um, to, to subdue it and, and consume it. And so, you know, why do they have these, um, these venom proteins in their, um, in their, their secretions? So I, I guess we should, um, we should back up just a little bit here and, and help folks understand um, the, the different radiations of venomous snakes here. So we've got the viparids and viparids have, um, have front fangs those fangs are rotatable. So they, the way they attach to the upper jaw, those fangs can fold in or out. And so this would be things uh, like in North America, the, the rattlesnakes, right? But there are vipers all over the world. So that's one major lineage of venomous snakes. The other major lineage of venomous snakes are the elapids. And the elapids also have front fangs, but they are um, typically um, shorter and they're, um, they're always fixed on the jaw. They don't, they don't move. So we say that they have fixed front fangs and the elapids includes things like cobras, crates, mambas, um, and a number of the elapids are very dangerous to humans in terms of our risk of envenomation. Um, some of the, the viparids are dangerous as well, but the, um, the, 
activity rate of the, the viparid venoms is a little lower than that of the elapids. You know, some of the elapids, if you, if you get a, a full bolus of, of venom, you know, you may only have minutes to live if you don't get medical treatment. Um, none, of the vi- the, none of the vipers are quite that significant. Um, uh, but I shouldn't, I shouldn't, I'm not trying to diminish the, the dangerous nature of some of the, the viparids as well. Uh, so then, so those, those are the two groups that we have traditionally um, considered to be the venomous snakes. There's this whole other radiation of snakes, which um, for a very long time were just grouped into this, uh, this family called the colubridae, the colubrids. And we now know that this doesn't represent a single um, evolutionary lineage. This is actually several lineages. We'll, we'll not deal with that here today. Um, but within the, the colubrids, as historically defined, um, there were a couple of species of snakes that people knew or, or discovered relatively early um, that were dangerous to humans. Um, the African twig snake and the boom slang, for example. Um, and actually, um, both of those species killed very prominent herpetologists because they underestimated um, the, the dangerous nature of bites from those species. Yeah. Um, but, the, but the vast majority of the rest of the colubrids have been considered to be non-venomous um, for a very long time because when they bite humans, there's little to no impact. Um, and so our, our definition of venomousness was very human-centric. And this is actually one of the the, the themes that I picked up during my PhD work and worked a lot on was, um, you know, trying to, um, to figure out um, what was going on with these snakes ecologically. So, so maybe they're not dangerous to humans, but clearly something's happening when they bite their prey. And we can come back to that in a moment. But this family of, of snakes, the, the colubrids, they all have fangs in the back of their mouth um, the venom gland that's associated with those fangs is a little bit different structurally than the, the venom glands that we see in the elapids and the viparids. Um, and this northern water snake fits into this latter group, um, so the, the colubrids. And, um, and again, this is a snake that if it bites a, a human, it's not going to feel good. And because of this, uh, these anticoagulant properties of the venom, you're going to have pretty copious bleeding, um, but you're not going to die. You don't got to go to the hospital. You know, there's, there's no risk to your life for an average healthy person here. Right. So, so now back to this question, you know, why do they have this anticoagulant? Nobody knows for sure. Um, there is some speculation that at some point in their evolutionary history, perhaps northern water snakes were feeding on something other than um, snakes, or excuse me, than uh, fish and frogs and, you know, the things that they typically feed on now. And this may be kind of an evolutionary holdover from different dietary needs. Um, mm. Yeah, we don't, you know, we don't know for sure. Um, there is a lot of interest in this, uh, this anticoagulant, though, as there are in all anticoagulants that we see in venoms. And these are pretty broadly distributed among venomous um, animals, because, as we all know, there are a number of different blood clotting disorders. And um, there is the potential um, pharmacological use of some of these proteins if we can isolate them and, and control their delivery in, in, in terms of, you know, getting them into um, into humans who are maybe at risk for one of these coagulation disorders could potentially treat those. Right. Yeah. It was a very long question or answer to that question. I'm sorry. Oh, no, that's great. Because uh, in part, because it kind of leads into our, one of our main topics that we want to get to, we want to make sure we have time for it. And that's uh, this idea of the taxon specific venoms. So maybe we should go into that a little bit more. Yeah. Um, so, you know, again, the way that we've defined venomousness has been very human centric for a very long time. And so there was this whole group of animals, group of snakes that were considered to be non-venomous because they bite a human and virtually nothing happens. But then a bunch of observations started coming in from the field where people were observing various species of snakes um, as they were trying to capture and subdue their prey. And what they were noticing is that um, either these animals weren't using any constriction 
or if they were using constriction, and again, remember, constriction is kind of the other extreme uh, way of dealing with, with prey, right? You can use venom, you can use constriction, and we now know that a lot of them use some combination of the two. Um, but a lot of these animals were, you know, say capturing a lizard or a bird or something, not using any constriction, and yet the prey animals were um, becoming very compliant and then dying very, very rapidly, which, you know, makes you stop and sort of scratch your head. You know, what's what's going on here? Um, this seems um, contradictory to what we thought we knew about uh, about snake biology. And so we started, you know, trying to, to figure this, this out. And uh, so this is a lot of the work that I did. I worked with a whole bunch of different species, focused on three for my own dissertation, but worked with a couple of dozen other species um, over my years in Dr. Maxey's lab and, and subsequently. And, um, you know, this, this work is not very, um, it's not very glamorous. And uh, I'm probably going to come back in the next life as a laboratory animal because <laughs> of all the horrible things that um, that I, I had to do to poor hapless creatures to, to discover some of this. But, you know, unfortunately, it still requires um, the use of animal models to figure some of this stuff out. And, and it, it's not a, a pleasant part of, of this work. But, um, you know, essentially what we would do is we would extract venom from these animals um, that venom then gets freeze dried so that we can then reconstitute it at known concentrations. And that's a really important part of this because we're trying to quantify the toxicity of these venoms, right? And we want to be able to compare, um, you know, say a, a northern water snake to a Great Basin rattlesnake to a, a you know, an Asian forest cobra. Um, and so we will need to know the, the exact concentration of that, of that venom. So we reconstitute it and then we would deliver known doses of that venom into prey animals. And for some of these species, we would use a whole bunch of different model organisms to try and figure out if there were taxa specific effects. So we might use say crickets for an invertebrate model. We might use um, anoles, brown anoles as, uh, as a, a lizard model. We might use, um, you know, Dale chickens or something as a bird model uh, and then mice as a, a mammal model. And so you inject them with the venom at different doses and then you can, um, you wait to see what proportion of the animals die or what the biological impacts are on the animals due to that venom injection. So this is why I think I'm going to probably come back as a, a prey animal. I'm probably going to be a, a chicken at some point and come back and be injected with, with venom. It was uh, not a pleasant part of the job, but it's fascinating because you know, you do this with a, a series of different venoms. And what you quickly discover is that, say, the venom from a brown tree snake, you know, you inject it into a mouse um, at a biologically, what we thought would be a biologically relevant dose, and virtually nothing happens to the mouse. Mm -hmm. Yet you inject just a fraction of that amount into a lizard model, and the lizard is dead. Um, so clearly, there's something very specific that's happening in the physiology of the lizard that's different than, um, the, than the mouse. And so the, the next steps of that then we're trying to figure out um, if there were specific venom molecules that were leading to that. And so there have been a number of molecules now which have um, been isolated and have now been confirmed to have taxic, taxa specific toxicity. So maybe they've evolved to work specifically on birds, um, and, and, or lizards or whatever, um, the, the, the specific mechanism in the body of the prey animal, all of that is still being worked out, right? So what is it about the three-dimensional conformation of this molecule from a brown tree snake and this very similar molecule in a, in a, in a rattlesnake, right? Why does the rattlesnake molecule have an impact on mice? Um, whereas the brown tree snake only has an impact on a bird or a lizard or whatever. That's kind of the, the state of this field right now. Um, it's trying to figure out molecularly what's going on in the body of these prey animals. Okay. So it's observable and quantifiable, but what the exact activity is, is still under debate. 
the mechanism, yep, the biochemical mechanism is still being sorted out. Cool. Okay. So what species did you mainly focus on during your dissertation? You mentioned three primary ones. Yeah, so um, so I first started working with the brown tree snake. And um, if your listeners aren't already familiar, this is the critter that um, is native to Southeast Asia uh, and was inadvertently uh, introduced to the island of Guam mm -hmm. during World War II. And, um, you know, this thing has just wrecked the island of Guam. It's led to the, the local extinction of many of the vertebrate species that live there, birds and lizards and bats and other things. Um, so because of the, the major impacts of this species um, on the island of Guam, the, um, the U.S. government was actually providing a, a number of research grants to help understand the biology of this thing. And so our lab had a grant to look specifically at the venom of the brown tree snake. So we published a bunch of papers uh, on the brown tree snake, including some um, ontogenetic effects, some taxa specific stuff, um, all kinds of different things with brown tree snakes. Um, and then I got really interested in, um, in lizard feeders. And uh, so I started working with the genus Oxybelus and um, some of your listeners might know this, this genus of snakes. There's six or seven, um, depending on who you ask, species of Oxybelus. They're native to the New World tropics. Um, they're commonly referred to as the vine snakes. Mm -hmm. um, so I worked with two species, Oxybelus fulginus, which is the, the green vine snake, and it's native to northern South America. And then um, the brown vine snake, Oxybelus aeneas, um, it has a much broader distribution. It actually makes it um, into the into the United States, um, in extreme southern Arizona, um, in a couple of, of canyons right there on the border. And then it ranges through Mexico and through Central America. Um, but both of those species are um, are lizard feeders, and it, you know something in their venom is specific to the lizard physiology because very low doses. Um, a venom will knock a lizard flat. In fact, if you look at, um, at the toxicity of the oxybelus snakes to lizards, it's right on par with the toxicity of, of many of the rattlesnakes to mammals. So um, very, very toxic if you're a lizard. You definitely don't want to be bitten by one of those guys if you're a lizard or a bird for that matter. Um, but, you know, mammals, especially large mammals like ourselves, virtually no effect. Hmm. Interesting. And, and does this, as you were studying, you mentioned brown anoles as, as one of the organisms you used to test it. Did you test it with other lizards too? Is this broad spectrum as far as lizards are concerned? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, it's hard to come up with good, um, good lizard models because you've got to have, you know, I, ideally we would have populations of inbred lizards that are all, you know, genetically very similar to one another, like we have with, with laboratory mouse and rat populations. We don't have that, um, but you've got to find some sort of relatively small lizard in large numbers that aren't going to have, uh, you know, as you're harvesting those from the wild, that they don't have a, a, a negative impact as we harvest them. So right. we were actually um, looking for um, introduced populations of brown anoles. So we had people in some of the southern states where brown anoles had been introduced and they were collecting brown anoles for us. Uh, the other model that we used a lot um, were Mediterranean house geckos, the genus Hemidactylus. Mm -hmm. You know, these things have been introduced all over the, the southern tier of states here in the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, and so we felt like we could utilize those, um, you know, somewhat, I won't say humanely necessarily, although, you know, we treat them as humanely as we can, but at least ethically from an environmental standpoint, we could harvest those animals. Right. Since they're invasive in so many places. <laughs> yeah. I remember the density of brown anoles in Hawaii when I lived there was incredible. <laughs> right. Yeah. We need, we need someone on Hawaii to, to capture brown anoles and ship them to us for, for venom models. Yeah. They could, they could scoop up huge numbers of them. Yeah, or the little day geckos, right? I mean, they're, oh, those yeah. things are all over the Hawaiian <laughs> Islands. Yeah. Oh, Ruben was wondering if clonal lizards like morning geckos could be a good model since genetically they're so similar. They would. They would, be, uh, they would be a really great model if we could produce them in great enough numbers, um, you know, in an economically viable way. Um, 
know somebody else here is asking what about the self-cloning geckos yeah they would be an amazing model but we can't seem to produce enough of them to to meet our needs yeah i guess that makes sense when when you uh when you don't want them you seem like you have plenty but as soon as you want them then... <laughs> <laughs> right yeah i've been raising morning geckos for years and uh, when when people want them, I think, oh, I have a bunch of eggs, but they haven't hatched. And then as soon as people don't want them anymore, I have like 25 all of a sudden. Yep. Yep. <laughs> well, you know, just to, to give those two listeners um, some sense here, you know, a single a single venom trial, you know, with replication and whatnot, you know, you might go through 30 or 40 lizards at a, at a time. So, right. you know, you'd have to have huge colonies in you order would. to make that work. Yeah, that makes sense. And so from a standpoint of practicality, since you can collect the density of, like I was saying, the brown and is insane. So yeah. That, that makes sense. Yep. Uh, and both of them, you know, as, as we already noted, are invasive species in some parts of the country. So, right. you know, we want to get rid of them anyway. So yeah. any ecological impact you would have would be beneficial. Yep. So yep. that makes sense. Well, wow. This, there's so much to think about. There's a lot of this, um, you know, I had a general idea of some of the topics we talk about, but I'm, I'm discovering a lot of really cool new things that I, I just hadn't thought of before. So this is this is fantastic. Yeah, well, uh, you know, this is this is an endlessly fascinating um, topic. And, and again, for me, uh, I was most interested in, again, the ecological interactions of the species. Right. So what is this snake eating and, and how um, how does that um relate to its venom composition. And we haven't even gotten into at all the, the potential pharmacological use of some of these you know, venom molecules. So there are entire other labs um, around the country and around the world where they don't even work with the, the animals themselves anymore. You know, they would let other labs sort of work with the animals, figure out what's going on, what's in the venom, what's the, the list of, of different proteins that are in there. Those other labs then work just with the, the purified proteins. And in many cases, they don't, you know, it's not even a natural source of those proteins. They've, they've put them into a, a, a clonal, um, you know, vector mechanism into bacteria. So the bacteria are being cultured and they're producing um, purified toxin of some sort, right? And then that lab is working just with the toxin to figure out what the biochemistry is so that they can then um, ascertain whether or not there might be an impact um, on humans that might be beneficial, right? So there's a whole suite of, of drugs now on the market that are being used to treat human disease um, that were originally discovered and described from reptile venoms. And we don't get them from reptile venoms now, right? They're, they're made synthetically, um, sure. but, you know, Xenotide uh, is, is a relatively new drug on the market um, that's used to treat type two diabetes. And exenatide um, originally came from the venom of a Gila monster, right? So there are all of these other labs that are looking at the, the pharmacological role of uh, venom proteins. So it, this is a huge, huge field. Right. And it works out nicely for those of us who have an interest in reptiles that uh, these, these compounds and these, these venoms can have a pharmacological impact because then it's easier to get funding. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, that's cool. And of course, the, the beneficial effects are not to be downplayed, but it's just, it's nice that it, it, it ties together that way. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Invasive brown anole species, they're out-competing poor green anoles. That's right. Yeah. Those green anoles are having a hard time. I And in Hawaii, the green anoles were introduced first. Um, I think it was in the 1950s. And then the the brown and were introduced decades later. And when I got there, you could see that that was happening, uh, that the, the green and were much less common. There was some resource partitioning going on. The green and tended to hang out higher up in the mm -hmm. uh, the foliage, maybe like five to 12 feet or something like that. And the brown and were ground level and up to, a, you know, three, four, five feet. Wow. Yeah. Fascinating. But it was still obvious that for every green and all you saw, you saw 10, 12 brown and all. So it was happening. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think I can echo what Ruben is saying here. This is, this is a, 
a fascinating topic. Yeah, we're we're all grateful that you came to tell us about this, and I feel like I could. I'm I'm excited to just tell tell people about this and say go watch this. You know, people who haven't seen it yet. Cool. Well, I, I, uh, I, you know, even the the difference between venom and poison, right? I, I sometimes um, kid with people about um, you know being able to spread the the venom gospel, right? Uh, you know, just correcting people when they misuse the terms venom versus versus poison. Um, you know, it, I, we might circle back to that for just a minute because um, you know. I, I have heard people say there is no such thing as a poisonous snake. And that also is not true, right? Because we do have some snakes which meet the, the strict definition of being poisonous, where they have to be um, ingested to have a, an impact. So there are some of these Asian natrocenes, you know, water snake relatives that are feeding on, um, on poisonous amphibians. And they're, um, they've, they've not only developed the ability to um, process those poisons in a way which doesn't impact them negatively, but they've also evolved the ability to then take those poisons and sequester them into their own body. And so there's a, a, a handful of snake species that have these nuchal glands on the back of their neck where they sequester these, um, these poisons. And the idea then is uh, many of them have bird predators so if a, a bird is coming and is trying to attack the head of the snake to kill it so it could eat it, it might then rupture that nuchal gland, get the poison out onto the skin, and at least it's distasteful, if not somewhat harmful to the bird predator, uh, and so the snake could avoid predation. Um, some of these snakes are actually rear fanged and venomous as well. So we do have a couple of snake species which are known to be venomous and poisonous, poisonous, which is just really interesting. It is. I've heard that for um, the, the same thing. I've heard for keelback snakes. I've heard it for hognose snakes that they may be sequestering poisons from toads and that some, at least some subspecies of garter snakes may be sequestering um, toxins yep. from newts. Yep. And then there's, there's uh, I guess it's it's been said that garter snakes could be considered uh, mildly venomous as well. Yeah, the the wandering garter snake um, has actually produced at least one instance of a medically significant bite. Um, wow. You know, the the individual um, probably had um, some increased sensitivity for one reason or another, and the the bite was um, intentional and prolonged. And um, yeah, the individual experienced some neurotoxic um, symptomology that was medically significant. And so they you know, went to get some, some treatment. Um, so yeah, you know, you gotta watch out for our little wandering garter snake <laughs> friends. They're not just, uh, you know, taking out um, amphibians and, and fish. Um, you know, maybe they're, you know, they may be feeding on mammals, uh, small mammals, and there may be enough, um, activity in that venom to, you know, take out a mouse or at least, you know, baby mice, that sort of thing. Yeah. You no, know, it's a, that's a, a, a story that someone needs to pursue. Yeah. It makes sense with some of the, especially since wandering garters can be sort of mm, semi-aquatic or at least spend time right around bodies of water. But I've seen them out in desert areas too, where they're probably yeah. more lizards and, and rodents than anything yep. else. Yep. Yep. Same. And here's, oh, here's something that I, oh, sorry. I wanted to say, first of all, thank you to Kimber Dillon for the super chat. Appreciate that. Woo -woo. And, and then uh, David was kind of summarizing what you said earlier. Venom is mostly characterized as injectable and poison mostly ingestible. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And <laughs> Ruby is fierce. Uh, I have a garter snake named Ruby. She's fairly large. She's like, uh, what, 43 inches now. Oh my gosh, that's a huge garter. She's big. She's from a Mon Montana locality of the uh, the red sided garter, uh -huh. and she um, she will take down sometimes three adult mice in one sitting. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so it, it makes sense to me that some of these larger garters, especially the females, would be dispatching rodents in the wild. There's yeah. Little What's uh, I'd be interested to to know what her feeding behavior is like. Um, is she a good constrictor or not such a good constrictor? A lot of the garters I've seen, they're not the the 
greatest constrictors. Right. She is not at all. Um, I've heard that some some species are more so than others. I've heard that the wandering are actually more of a constrictor than some of the others. Mm -hmm. uh, but she does not constrict at all uh, when she eats. And of course, I'm not giving her live prey very often. Right. Um, I will give her live worms or live fish sometimes, but that's I don't give her live rodents. But it's really interesting to me to see, and I don't know if what I'm seeing can be you know, attributed to the way the venom works or anything. But a lot of times when I feed my garters, whether it's live earthworms or it's just, you know, frozen thawed mouse, they will grab it and kind of sit there with it in their mouth for a minute as if they're waiting for envenomation. Mm. And once it's down a little bit enough so that their rear fangs could make contact with it and whatnot, they'll sit there for a minute as if they're envenomating it. And I don't know if that's what they're doing or not, but then, uh, I know that venom delivery is not sophisticated like it is in a viper or something, but right. it seems like they're doing something and then they'll start to swallow it. Yeah, I've noticed the same sort of thing in a number of the colubrids where, you know, they'll bite to, to grab onto the, the prey item. And then they, you know, they're carefully walking that thing into the rear of their mouth where they can fully engage those rear fangs. Um, and so it seems pretty clear that, you know, they... Um, they know behaviorally what to do there to engage those fangs. And, and clearly they are delivering venom uh, at that point. So it's fascinating behavior. It is very much so. And I'm glad that I, uh, I've had garters occasionally tag me when I'm feeding and they get a little confused because they're excited about what's going on, but they never actually chew. <laughs> they, they let go pretty fast. Yeah. And I'm glad. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay. Yeah. Eating an American toad, an adult yep. American toad is pretty big. So yeah, yeah, they are. Makes sense. Cool. Well, it looks like uh, we're just about at the end of our time. Oh my gosh, that hour went fast. It did. It went really fast. And so I want to first of all thank you so much for joining us again. I learned a lot, and I think our our listeners did too. And I'm I'm really excited about it. And um, I wanted to make sure that you have a chance to say anything parting words you'd like to say, how people can contact you, um, anything else? Yeah. Uh, well, thank you, first of all, Russ, for the, the invitation to be here. I really uh, enjoyed the conversation. Um, thanks to your listeners for their, their great questions. Um, so you can see uh, a link there running along the bottom of the screen that'll take you to um, what my expert profile on um, the Southern Utah University website. Uh, so you can, you can see some of the the work that I've done there, some additional media appearances, that sort of thing. But there's also means to contact me there if you've got uh, additional questions or, or anything like that. Um, I probably should just point out that um, most of my, my current research is actually not with venoms these days. Um, we lack some of the tools necessary to do some of these sophisticated um, you know, biochemistry techniques here at, at SUU. Um, but I've been doing a lot with... Um, uh, reptile community ecology uh, recently. So um, a number of, of papers looking at kind of natural history of, of various reptiles here in the, the southern Utah area. And we're specifically interested in um, looking at how habitat change, uh, habitat manipulation by humans impacts reptile communities. So that's something we've been working on a lot uh, the last few years. Yeah, you've got lots of uh, fascinating things going on. Maybe at some point in the future, we could get back and talk about some of those. Yeah, absolutely. I'd love it. Cool. Excellent. Well, once again, thanks for joining us. Um, and I'm glad that uh, this is going to be uploaded just as usual. So those of you who missed it and or just caught a little portion of it, you'll be able to watch the replay in its entirety. So um, look forward to that. And thanks again for joining us. And thank you, everyone else, for joining as well. And we'll catch you on the next one.